Bonsoir tout le monde. Merci aux courageux qui ont bravé le froid, la fatigue et la fin de la semaine pour rester avec nous. Vous avez bien raison parce que ça va être une session tout à fait formidable sur un sujet tout à fait passionnant. Alors je vais commencer par une petite plaisanterie. Vous savez qu'on dit du pont et du ponté. Nous, on a fait boyer le boyer ce soir. On sera les deux chairman de cette session. Donc Marion de Boyer, je crois qu'on s'est pas mal vu pendant, pendant ces deux jours. Et Laurent Boyer, qui est professeur de santé publique à Marseille. On va avoir le, le plaisir de présider cette session sur le Covid et les maladies mentales qui va être euh, remarquablement euh, décrite par deux spécialistes du sujet que sont Livia de Piqueur de euh, l'université euh, d'Anvers à l'hôpital euh, Dufel et euh, Francesco Beneditti qui travaille à l'université de Milan. Ils vont traiter les deux faces de Covid et santé mentale selon deux approches complémentaires. Livia va nous parler de, du, du conséquence du Covid chez les patients avec une maladie mentale préexistante. Et Francesco va nous parler de ce qui se passe chez les patients qui ont eu le Covid et qui vont développer des conséquences neuropsychiatriques. Alors on va avoir une discussion extrêmement animée grâce à vous. Donc on compte sur vous pour, pour la discussion. Et sans tarder, je passe la parole à Livia. Good evening. Such a pleasure to be here again. I was speaking at the same conference last year, also on the topic of COVID-19. And since then, we've learned so much more. Uh, unfortunately, COVID is still here, even if the, a lot of restrictions uh, are a little bit looser right now. And it will still stay here for uh, however far we can look into the future. At least that's my best guess. So. It is very relevant to us working in psychiatry, neurology, neurosciences to stay up to date about the interactions of COVID and mental illness. So we want to make this uh, session today as interactive as possible. So I'm going to keep my talk brief uh, and also Professor Benedetti will do the same. So um, quite quickly, we can go into a full discussion talking about patients that we've seen, how we've been treating our patients, our own experiences, questions that may still arise, and we hope to also hear from you. Feel free to ask your questions in French. Uh, I can understand it, and we have translators available, <laughs> and we will answer uh, in English. Well, my conflict of interest, as you can see, and then let's jump into this. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, policy, about what we have been doing uh, to take targeted actions for patients with mental illness in the course of the COVID pandemic, starting with raising awareness, uh, the evidence on the COVID-19 risks, and then uh, joint recommendations. Because this is a very, very serious subject, and already quite early in the pandemic, um, as early even as uh, the first wave in September 2020, we have seen the first reports emerge um, on increased risks of COVID-19 infections in patients with severe mental illness. Um, so this was very worrying to us as psychiatrists. And then when the first vaccine came to the European Union in December, uh, many colleagues have uh, raised uh, um, questions about ethical arguments um, that our patients really should be given priority to get the vaccine. And they were saying, well, you know, these patients already have a reduced life expectancy. They have all kinds of comorbid conditions. They're very vulnerable. They're at increased risk of COVID. And so they should be on the priority list. And on top of that, uh, there's also biological reasons, immunological reasons why these patients are indeed more vulnerable to all kinds of infections. We already knew from decades of research that patients with severe mental illness are at, increased, are at increased risk of all kinds of viral infections. And it's so um, not surprising that we find the same thing for COVID-19. We have um, decades of research, um, so many papers showing underlying trait like immune disturbances in patients with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, 
their uh, immune cells show accelerated aging, and so it's, uh, we know that age is a very important risk factor for COVID, and our patients have accelerated aging, so at an earlier age, they will already be at an increased risk. And then we also hypothesized that they would have um, a lower response to the vaccine. But unfortunately, uh, our calls were not heard because then when we checked these uh, national vaccination plans in February 2021, so when the, the vaccine was being deployed in the initial phase all across the, uh, the continent, we saw that it was only four countries that had actually given priority vaccination to people with mental illness, even though by that time, the um, ultra ratio of their risk for mortality was clearly demonstrated to be higher than that of other disorders that were given priority. So luckily, uh, and in response to our campaign that we did to really lobby in several European countries for priority vaccination, we have seen changes in uh, the European plans in, in many countries, including, by the way, also uh, in France. And we have uh, to thank Professor Le Boyer for uh, uh, that effort and that result. But it doesn't end there because then, okay, our patients are vaccinated, but there are still increased risks to take into account. And those risks uh, also we've investigated. We first started with an initial meta-analysis. This was by the summer of 21. So that um, analysis included 23 studies and it concluded that there was indeed um, an increased risk of death with any kind of mental disorder pre-existent to the COVID infection at an odds ratio of two. The risk was higher in patients with mood and psychotic disorders. And since then, one year later, we've confirmed that finding in a meta review of systematic reviews and meta analysis. So we have um, uh, evidence of an increased infection risk, uh, in particular in patients with schizophrenia, mood, anxiety, and alcohol related disorders. We have uh, a higher risk of COVID hospitalization, except in psychotic disorders, not an increased risk of ICU admission, but a very robust evidence of higher mortality, again, particularly in psychotic and mood disorders. So this is really such a robust finding that we can say now with full confidence, yes, our patients are twice as likely to die from a COVID-19 infection compared to someone without pre-existent mental health disorders of the same age, gender, the same kind of underlying uh, comorbidities and risk profile. So we need to take preventive action. It's really super important that we take this information and we use it for the benefit of our patients and to avoid uh, deaths that should not have happened. And there is another problem because even if they are given priority for vaccination, it appears to be there is a vaccination lag, a vaccination delay um, or a gap in patients with severe mental illness. So we have seen reports from UK demonstrating that. Also in Israel, we have seen uh, a 2.2% lower vaccination rates in patients with schizophrenia, despite them having higher comorbidities. So they should actually have a higher vaccination rate than the control group. Uh, and this is very worrying because we've just shown that this is a risk group. They should be having the highest possible vaccination rate, but it's not the case even if they're given priority. And some, uh, some colleagues, some authors have argued that maybe this is just a matter of vaccine hesitancy and maybe patients with some kinds of mental disorders like psychotic disorders, they are more hesitant to, uh, to the vaccine and they just don't want to be vaccinated. And then, well, you know, there's not much that we can do about this. And I would disagree with that point of view. Because we've seen um, and also published in our country, in Belgium, that if you um, have a targeted vaccination program, that you can achieve a very high um, and equal vaccination rate to the general population in patients with very severe mental illness. And what, the, what we did differently in our country, I think, compared to the reports from UK and Israel, is that we have really uh, vaccinated the patients with mental illness 
in the mental health clinics, in their um, setting that they're used to, that they're coming um, uh, on a daily or weekly basis for their mental health treatment, by the nurses that they are familiar with and that they receive their regular mental health care from, which is something very different from what happened in other countries where patients had to go themselves to a community center where then everyone was being um, vaccinated. So you have big, um, big places with a lot of unfamiliar people, um, very crowded. Uh, it's also very complicated because you need to know, you know how to follow the process to, get, to then get vaccinated. So we believe that all of these steps that people have to take to get a vaccine, they are barriers that are limiting access to vaccination in a vulnerable population. And so what we should do is really um, lobby and advocate for equitable access to vaccination, which means removing any kind of barriers or difficulties that patients may experience when, um, when getting their vaccines. And this is uh, an example of a global call to action for exactly that, um, that goal. This was launched in, uh, in the spring. Um, advocating for equitable vaccine access, not just in terms of COVID, it's just, this is not new. All of this, the vaccination delays, the higher risk of infection already existed for other infections. It's just that we are now seeing it more clearly and it's being amplified by COVID-19. Also worrisome, and this is, uh, I would say, preliminary data, and we need definitely more proof to, to make, um, to confirm this finding, but we have seen reports of a higher risk of breakthrough infections after vaccination in patients with mental disorders, suggesting that even if they are vaccinated, their risk is still increased, uh, and maybe their response to the vaccine is also lower than in patients without mental disorder. We are currently uh, studying this ourselves in a, a prospective study. These are results from electronic health records. And then finally, uh, we've also now, um, well, we're in the process of publishing uh, this guidance paper on COVID-19 risks of patients with mental disorders. This is um, a list of recommendations with the support of also patient organizations, family organizations, uh, and several scientific organizations. And what it, what it basically concludes to is we should tackle all kinds of sources of systemic bias. We need to make sure patients have access to vaccination and testing, access to treatment and hospitalization. Remember, increased hospitalization rates, except in patients with psychotic disorders, but they have the highest mortality risks. So this does raise the question, are patients with psychotic disorders dying from COVID because they are not having access to being hospitalized for whatever reason. I think this is a very real possibility and we need to take this very seriously. Access to psychiatric care, we know that has been very difficult during the pandemic. Uh, psychopharmacological treatments um, and how they were interfering with COVID and with uh, uh, COVID treatment and then also the impacts of community and collective living. All of this should be a research priority. There is so much that we still don't know, and I'm going to show you a little bit of data from our own work um, to, to give you an idea. So what we have done uh, both in Belgium and in um, Paris uh, hospitals with Professor Le Boyer was sample every new psychiatric admission to the psychiatric hospitals uh, from January to April uh, 2021. Uh, and then compare them to uh, a matched set of caregivers of the same hospitals. And then we have looked at um, the COVID antibodies, both in the patients and in the caregivers. And these are results for the patients with uh, psychotic spectrum disorders, where you can see in the blue. In Belgium, in our site, almost 70%, 70% of patients had COVID antibodies in their blood compared to 15% of the controls. In Paris, it was even higher. 83% of patients with psychotic spectrum disorders have been exposed to COVID. All of these people never had a positive PCR test, never had a known COVID infection. 
So the exposure of our patient population to the virus is huge and it's much bigger than we know. And it is posing a real threat to their mental health and to their physical health. And there is something, al something else very strange going on with their uh, response to uh, the COVID-19, because then if we compare um, amongst people who have um, COVID antibodies, the tighter of the combined antibodies, and this is a combination of spike and nucleocapsid uh, antibodies, the titers are significantly higher in the patients compared to the healthy controls. So there is something different happening in their immunological response to the virus that may or may not have uh, led to the psychiatric decompensation. We, we can't prove that, um, but it's, it's a very possible scenario. Other things that we don't know, what's the impact of our medication? You've heard probably already that some kinds of antidepressants appear uh, to be protective against COVID-19. We've recently shown the same thing for, for lithium, which uh, has been hypothesized and has been shown to have in vitro antiviral effects. Um, then there is some other compounds that have shown possibly um, a worse outcome for COVID-19. It has been suggested for antipsychotics, but not confirmed. And then um, most recently, actually, it has been confirmed for Valproate that uh, the outcomes are worse with COVID-19. But again, we need so much more work. So our take home messages, we know for sure that in patients with any kind of pre-existing mental illness, but specifically psychotic and mood disorders uh, have the highest risk, there is a double chance of getting hospitalized and dying from COVID-19. We need a proactive approach for vaccine equity. We need to reach out, we need to talk to patients time and time again, especially with you because you're their trusted healthcare providers about how important it is for them to be vaccinated and to get all of the boosters and to be protected. We need to prioritize research on the COVID-19 risks because we, there is far too many questions that we still don't have any answers for. And as a psychiatrist, I really feel this is the time to step into our health advocate role and not just um, defend our patient when they're coming to us in our clinical practice, but also step outside, raise awareness, talk to politicians, do the lobbying, because there's no one else who will do it for them. If we don't do it, they're just being forgotten in the vaccination strategies, in the policy strategies, and, and at the government tables where the big decisions are being made. Many thanks to all of our collaborators in Duffel and also at uh, INSEAD in Paris and Toulouse. This I will maybe talk about later on. And then uh, just a little bit of uh, advertising. If there are people who are interested about the links of immune changes and psychiatric disorders, there is a very good book I can recommend you uh, where you will find out all of the background for what I talked about today. Voila, this has been my talk. Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Lydia, for a very uh, lively and important talk, very precise as usual and very clear. I think this is really important messages, so thank you very much for sharing them with you. And now I'm pleased to invite to the floor Professor Benedetti, who is going to describe the other side of the coin, which is the consequences of uh, COVID on the mental health of uh, patients having never had any psychiatric disorder beforehand. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you very much for inviting me here. And thank, uh, thanks to you for still being here and listening. I will try to present in a short time a lot of data because there are really a lot of data on this, uh, on this situation of post-COVID depression. We called it this way, but it has uh, received a lot of different names, of course, post-acute COVID syndrome and whatever in the literature. But given that the symptoms are mainly anxiety and depression, I prefer to call it post-COVID depression. Got nothing to disclose. And uh, as Livia pointed out, uh, there is an inflammation theory of mood disorders. 
capitalizing the wide number of studies done in the field of uh, neuroimmunology, we know that uh, neurons speak with immune cells and immune cells speak with neurons and actually immune cells enter and exit the brain during all the day and all the night and provide the maintenance of the homeostasis of the brain. And what happens in patients with mood disorders especially is that there is, no, I wouldn't say a low grade inflammation as many say, but an unbalance, okay, between an excessive activation of the innate immunity and uh, problem, a uh, hampering of the adaptive immunity. And this is exactly the situation which is triggered by COVID, as you know, which causes a hyperinflammation during the acute phase, m activating a lot these, uh, uh, well, I think I could also try to have some pointers here. I don't know, difficult, okay. On the left, you see <laughs> the innate immunity cells, okay? These are heavily activated. And look at the number, because we will see the number of uh, granulocytes and those of platelets, which are activated when the endothelium suffer. On the right side, there are the lymphocytes, which clean uh, the virus, but uh, uh, it, it takes time, and the people die in between. And even after the virus has been cleaned, there are high levels of persisting activation of the innate immunity, which is very similar to what we observe in mood disorder. We do not know why mood disorder people have this imbalance. One of the hypotheses is that they may, they may be especially sensitive to certain viral infections. These pivotal studies by Robert Yolken and co-workers show that serum positivity for COVID and influenza virus do associate with mood disorders and suicide attempt, but also that patients with MDD have altered reactions to a whole array of viruses, such as the Epstein by viruses, and as Olivia showed, they also have altered responses to the COVID. And so I will go immediately to the take home message, which is that in the month following COVID-19, high rates of major depression is expected. Psychopathological features are the same of MDD. Neurocognitive impairment is very, very similar to that of MDD, and in our experience, it cannot be uh, disentangled for it, and very strikingly, brain correlates are the same. So it is suggested that uh, a neuropsychiatrist should be there when uh, post-COVID patients are seen. I will uh, rapidly go to, through four points. The prevalence of post-COVID depression, its psychopathological features, immune inflammatory biomarkers, and brain imaging correlates. Then we will just see a slide about course and treatment. So fasten the seat belts, please, because we start running with the prevalence. This is our first study this morning. It had been cited in less than two years, 860 times. We just, let's say, just visited patients after COVID, one month after clearance of the virus, and showed that they had clinically significant depression in the 30% of cases. And then all the world saw the same thing. But as I can see in the title, there are inflammatory predictors. We will see them after. Now this is just to show you, uh, look at the uh, bottom left, that depression is in the large majority of cases mild or moderate at one month or even three months after COVID. Then if it is not treated, it can get more and more severe. But at the beginning, they are mild, moderate cases which respect the same epidemiology of MDD in the general population, three to one ratio uh, for female versus males, and the patients who had previous episodes of depression are more likely to have a recurrence. And then patients also have a lot of anxiety and post-traumatic distress. But just in a few cases, they will develop post-traumatic stress disorders. Most of them will only have this acute anxiety, which then fades while depression stays up. This data has been immediately after our publication confirmed by the famous Laird study 
in the USA showing that people surviving COVID then had to go to a psychiatrist in the 30% of cases. And the most interesting thing is that the 13% of guys who never had any contact with psychiatry had to book a psychiatric interview in the six months after COVID, and it was always for depression and anxiety. Now I will show you the prevalence in a, a, a series of meta-analysis, okay? Without going into the details of uh, which interviews was done, which instruments were used, just look at the bold numbers. In this paper, 6,000 patients, they found 38% of incidence of depression. Again, 38% in this other paper with 4,000 people. Again, in this case, even 45% in this paper, uh, considering 23 studies and 4,000 people. And here we have 42% and 21%. Aggregating all these findings, we are now writing down what is, is called an umbrella review. It turns out that roughly 30% of patients surviving COVID pneumonia then developed clinical symptoms of depression. Which are the psychopathological features? They are exactly the same of MDD. These patients fit the criteria of DSM-5 for uh, a major depressive episode, but we went in deep in studying the mood congruent biases in information processing and the preferential processing of negatively stoned stimuli that you know it's a feature of depressed patients. Pa depressed patients, contrary to the healthy condition, are more rapid in evaluating what is negative in respect to what is positive, and if they have to describe themselves, they choose negative adjectives, negatively tuned moral adjectives. I am bad, I am a bad guy, I am vile, I am not brave, okay? It's not a matter of being uh, uh, pretty or ugly or rich or poor, it's uh, moral violence. So what we did, capitalizing, uh, using, exploiting these uh, studies done many years ago by the groups of Rebecca Elliott uh, and Barbara Sahakian and co-workers and showing that uh, in the, there is a top-down control in the cognitive generation of effect involving the frontal cortical limbic structures which modulate the reactivity to the stimuli and on the right side of the of the, of the slide, which I cannot point, unfortunately. <laughs> there is uh, uh, what happens in our patients with uh, a higher activations for n n positive stimuli blocking the reactivity of the amygdala to what is positive and enhancing the reactivity of the basal ganglia to what is negative. So exploiting this uh, long-standing research in MDD, we did the same in COVID. Look now at the left side on the x-axis, you, you see the ratio between latency for processing negative and ne positive stimuli, and in the y-axis, in the you see the self-rated depressions. White dot, uh, bottom left, uh, are healthy people surviving COVID. Black dot uh, are patients with COVID and depression, self-rated. And the crosses are severe MDD patients hospitalized for depression. You see that the relationship is the same. The populations are overlapping. On the right side, you see the frequency of negative self-scheme elements. I'm bad, I'm a, I'm, a people not, I'm a person not to be trusted, and so and so. Again, related to severity of self-rated depression. And again, you can see that post-COVID depression and severe MDD overlap. We went more in deep taking, using this questionnaire, which is a questionnaire about dysfunctional attitudes, which assess the dimensions of negative thinking uh, around uh, hypothetical events and try to see uh, the so-called uh, typical back uh, cognition depressive uh, uh, distortions. We associated these dimensions of emotional impact, attribution of causality, it's always my fault, generalization of cross time, it will never be good in the future, generalization across situation, I will 
always be faulty and never be able to do things, and I don't have the control of what happens, we associated it, as you can see in the right part of the slide, with suicidality and most of our depression. And again, going into the COVID patients, you see in the left part of the slide, the black dots are the COVID patients, but altogether it's just a subgroup. And so when they are depressed, uh, following the line in the middle, they overlap with depression. And the same is true for the uh, association between self-deprecation and these cognitive errors in depression. So it's the same psychopathological picture and what about neurocognitive impairment, the so-called brain fog or whatever? Um, you can see here a lot of uh, testing for neuropsychological features, verbal memory, verbal fluency, working memory, selective attention and processing speed. Look at the first part of the table, the bottom the, the top part of the table shows you the absolute values the patients have. And you can see now that there are no differences based upon sex or psychiatric history. The three to one prevalence of depression is not reflected in worse cognition in females in respect to males. That's completely independent. But you can see then in the bottom part of the table, the second part, the numbers in among brackets are the um, percentage of patients, sorry, um, yeah, the, the, the first numbers are the percentage of patients who have a uh, uh, impairment in cognition. So 78 of patients are impaired in at least one cognitive domain and executive function and psychomotor coordination are impaired in more than a half of the patients. Now look at the Bottom left part of the slide, the blue line above are healthy people. The blue line on the bottom are patients with MDD hospitalized. And the three lines in between are post-COVID depressed patients studied at one month, three months, six months after clearance of the virus. And as you can see, things do not go better over time. This neurocognitive impairment continues over the time, and it's very closely similar uh, to that uh, shown by major depressed patients with the exception of the speed of information processing. On the right part of the slide, you see that depression uh, as uh, uh, symptoms of depression, severity of depression is highly related with uh, this impairment in uh, neurocognitive functions and both influence quality of life in a detrimental way, blocking the people actually. And then fatigue, because I'm, I'm being told they don't sleep, they are fatigued, they are not truly depressed. No, they are truly depressed as I showed you and they are also fatigued in the same way as every depressed patient is fatigued. And as you can see, in the histograms, these gray histograms are terrible because these are the situation, this is the situation at one month, three months, six months, 12 months after clearance of the virus. And as you can see, the symptoms of fatigue over time tend to increase together with depression. On the right side, you see in the top what happened during the first wave, in the bottom, what happened during the second wave? Sorry, it's the contrary. It's strikingly similar, but in the second wave, the patients seem to be more worse, more severe. And now the immune inflammatory biomarkers. Is this picture related to something we can measure into the blood? The answer is yes. But the first thing to say is that it is not related to the residual clinical damage in the lungs or in any other organ, okay? They can overlap. There can be patients who have a major problem in their lungs, in their heart, in their kidneys, in whatever is affected by COVID, but not necessarily. A lot of patients do have depression without any physical impairment. 
And then we looked uh, in search for biomarkers at the blood count ratios, which are easy to calculate. These are the cells, you know, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, platelets, and these kind of measures have been growing in the literature. Neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, monocyte to lymphocyte ratio, platelet to lymphocyte ratio can be easily calculated, are cheap, and look at the literature, look at the histograms. It's the exponential growth in the number of papers looking at these markers of pathology and showing in a meta-analysis we did many years ago that subjects with uh, uh, BD, bipolar disorder or major depressive disorder are higher neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. It's unhealthy controls consistently. We used more, we found more affordable this index, which is called the Systemic Immune Inflammation Index, which is neutrophils per platelets on lymphocytes. Platelets can reveal the suffering of the endothelium, which is so important in COVID. And so this index is, though, is that which mainly associated with depression over time and with neurocognitive impairment. This is depression. This is the systemic inflammation index at hospital admission in males, black dots, and females, white dots, on the predicted back depression inventory or Zung self-depressive rating scales at three months after clearance of the virus. So the level of inflammation at the beginning still predicts significantly what happens months after and you can see in this rather complicated graph that the decrease in systemic inflammation, okay, x-axis, is related to the decrease in rating scales scores for depression. So if the patients decrease these indexes in the months after COVID, they heal. If not, they continue to stay depressed. And this is true also for neurocognitive impairment. You see a lot of uh, slides here, a lot of graphs. I told you 78% of the people have some kind of impairment, and you see here as an example, verbal fluency, verbal memory, attention and information processing. They are all related to the degree of inflammation. If inflammation was very low, everything can happen. But when inflammation grows, when it is higher, patients stratify toward worse outcomes. And then you can see also a proof of concept because several of our patients in Milano had been treated with these two biological drugs, Anakinra and Tocilizumab. They are monoclonal antibodies which block uh, the activity of interleukin 1 beta or end of interleukin 6. And when the patients had been treated with these drugs, they had the same, I have to say, death outcome of the others. But in the event that they survived, they did not develop depression because these drugs are powerful anti-inflammatory anti drugs. Look now in red at the systemic inflammation index at discharge of the patients treated with best available treatments, which means cortisones and things like this. It's 1,000. Patients treated with these cytokine blocking agents had 500, and they did not develop depression so much consider that the cutoff is the, uh, let's say, there is a consensus that the cutoffs su should be 320. We have found recently in a review which, are, uh, which is impressed uh, on uh, CNS drugs, six uh, studies investigating inflammatory markers and in particular CRP, interleukin-6, 10, TNF, and among these 16 studies, 13 were positive associating neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, CRP, C-reactive protein, our systemic immune inflammation index, or neutrophil count, or in a couple of studies, interleukin-6 and in single studies, 1, beta, and 10, with persistent post-COVID depression in patients. So in certain studies, both in Italy, not done by us, and in China, in Wuhan, the systemic immune inflammation index seem even to over outperform neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. Look at the graph. These two guys, Fieratne and Vieratne, in uh, Australia, studied a single case, a single patient for four months 
studying its immune inflammatory index, this SII. And every time SII showed a peak, the patients had an additional neurological or thromboembolic event. This is what happens. This is also what I observe in my patients. The course is oscillating over time. If things go well, this pattern normalizes and the patients heal. If it is not so, they still are depressed. So very quickly now, in the last five minutes, the brain imaging correlates. First, we have to say that the brain suffers during acute COVID. We studied in Italy, in our hospital, the NFL, the neurofilament light chain, which are part of the microstructure of the axon. This thing can be found in the peripheral blood, but they should be very low, I mean four, three, mm, as a level. During acute COVID, they can reach 100, top left of this complicated slide. And the higher they are, uh, the worse it goes because they are predictor of death. The, there is an acute suffering of neurons, both in the brain and in the periphery, during the acute inflammation of COVID. And you can find these markers of direct neuronal insult. In the periphery, as you can see here in this paper, which has been rejected two times, but I'm still submitting, uh, these uh, levels of neurofilaments in the periphery are associated with uh, age, C-reactive protein, interleukin-8, interleukin-9, aortaxin, MIP1-beta, all these markers of innate immunological activation. And so when uh, in the UK Biobank, they had a look at the people who had done an MRI before COVID and an MRI after COVID, they found clear signs of brain suffering with a reduction of gray matter thickness and uh, bilaterally in the parahippocampal gyrus, anterior cingulate cortex, temporal pole, and even an increase in the CSF in the water. What uh, uh, we did, what we had done, was to study a selected sample of 50 patients with a multimodal approach, replicating exactly the findings we had, show, we had seen in the previous studies we did, and showing, look here, that severity of current psychopathology associates with regional gray matter volumes both depression and post-traumatic distress associate with a reduction, let's say, with lower volumes in the anterior cingulate cortex and in the insula. And these are very well-known structures in MDD. Look at the left side. These are the most replicated findings, a reduction in the volume of, of medial peripheral cortex extending to the anterior cingulate and insula, bilateral temporal, is a clear association with uh, mood disorders. Look at the right side, it's the FEC. The famous studies done at the NIH by Drevets and Dongul showing that there are less glial cells. The volumes are reduced because glial cells have died. And then we studied diffusion tensor imaging, so white matter microstructure, looking at fractional anisotropy and axial diffusivity and, mean, and radial and mean diffusivity, which are all markers of the myelinated structure of neurons. In a first study, we had shown before that patients with mood disorders have changes in white matter structure associating with circulating levels of cytokines. And in post-COVID depression, I think this is the most important slide of this talk, this one and the second that I will show you. Look at, on the left, you have the systemic inflammation index I told you associating with widespread reduction in axial diffusivity. Axial diffusivity is a marker of axonal integrity, of directionality, of uh, water flowing along the axons, and it is associated with microstructures such as microtubules and neurofilaments. On the right side, you see CRP on the same parameters. 
This uh, slide is unpublished, we will submit soon. These are patients with subjective complaints of persistent changes in neurocognition throughout the brain. Patients with subjective complaints of brain fog compared with patients who say, well, I had the COVID, but I am as before. I feel very well, have a widespread reduction in fractional anisotropy and increased in mean diffusivity, water flowing throughout the brain, possibly associating with, this is what we are studying now, this persistent activation of innate immunity and unbalance in the immune system. Of course, this influences resting state functional connectivity, which associates with symptoms, but we don't have time to see it in deep. So what happens if you do nothing? Nothing good, as I told you. Neurocognitive impairment will continue, and these um, heat map are symptoms at three, six, and 12 months highly correlating among themselves. If they were not good at six months, they will not be at 12 months. On the left side, top left, you have the increase in depression in males and a slow decrease in females, but still staying at high levels of depression. On the bottom, you see what I told you before. Over one year, the post-traumatic distress symptoms tend to decrease by themselves. And then if you treat them, and uh, we spoke about this, uh, our colleagues here have the, exactly the same uh, results in their samples, it's sufficient to give, let's say <laughs> sufficient in brackets of course, to give an SSRI, a course of treatment with a serotonergic treatment, and they will be good rapidly, why? Well, I don't know, but when I, when I saw this data, I thought of when I was young and SSRIs were first introduced into treatment. All patients were so beautifully responding. And here we have patients who have, are in front of their first depressive episode. And so they have a rapid rep uh, restoring of, uh, of, uh, of, of health, of emotional health. We also developed, and, uh, and we are studying with our colleagues, uh, new ways of make some cognitive remediation therapy with computer-assisted uh, interventions. And as you can see, we, using this, uh, showed that this kind of, uh, of cognitive potentiation can improve several functions and uh, these will result in an improve in quality of life. So there are many ways of treating these patients, just they have to be correctly diagnosed and treated. And, uh, and so that's it, that's a part, the take home message. We need to find new therapeutic targets and treatment strategies also for the pharmacotherapy for mood disorders because the study of post-acute COVID-19 syndrome proved the importance of this close association between altered immune inflammatory set points, major depression, and this new entity of post-COVID depression, okay? The man with the big belly in the top left is me taking my light therapy in the morning in, uh, in Milano and the other people are all the people who did the, the work we, uh, I showed you. And now, ask something, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francesco. I'm, I think I'm going to use the light therapy as well because we are so productive, but maybe I'm going to do the same. <laughs> so congratulations, it's really exceptional. You've been the first to describe all these findings and you continue to explore them for, for the sake of our patients. So thank you very, very much. So for those of you who stay there, any questions, remarks, observations that you want to share with us? In French or in English, we can translate. Hi, <coughs> thank you for your presentations. Um, maybe this is a question for both of you. Um, how might uh, the BMI index be correlated with the observations that you have? Because my understanding, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist, but my understanding is that it's more prevalent in people with mental health disorders that they could be obese. And that has an influence on, on COVID and recovery. Yes, that's absolutely, absolutely true, especially for patients with psychotic disorders, that they are much more likely 
who have a, a higher BMI or obesity. And in all of the data that I've shown you about the increased risks, that has been taken into account. So it has been adjusted for age, sex, BMI, smoking, uh, comorbid conditions. So, um, and, and that's also part of what I wanted to say that um, there is an independent increased risk associated with the, psycho the psychotic disorder or psychiatric disorder. But apart from that, they also have increased risks through all of their other risk factors. So it's, it's even more than double increased risk, obviously. The, the two odds ratio is just from the psychiatric disorder itself independently. So, but how do you then know whether the inflammation is due to all the other comorbidities rather than the mental health disorder? Yeah. So when we uh, look in a meta-analysis or in a study looking at odds ratios, we make adjusted models adjusted for, for other um, disorders that are present or other risk factors that are present. But you're quite right. Based on those data, we can't prove if it's the inflammation. <laughs> So we just know that if you have a psychiatric disorder, taking into account all other things that we know can influence the data, you still have an increased risk. But we cannot say for sure if it's the psychiatric disorder, the medication that they're on, some kind of immunological trait linked to the psychiatric disorder, some kind of underlying genetic trait maybe even, because, and, and we've not talked about that today, but we have here today with us the expert immunogenetics in psychiatric disorders. Uh, Professor Le Boyer has published a huge amount of evidence showing that patients with bipolar, with schizophrenia, they have subtle but very real changes in their immunogenetic architecture. And so maybe if one of the reasons why these patients are shown to be at increased risk of all kinds of infections is because their immune system works a little bit differently genetically. Uh, and it's not a psychiatric disorder itself, but rather what is underneath that is showing up in these meta-analyses. What, what I can add uh, for the post-COVID conditions is that uh, yes, uh, uh, severity of COVID has been related, of course, to very high BMI, but in terms of death, in terms of post-COVID depression, I'm not so sure. I mean, we found no relationship up to now, and, uh, but it's also very difficult to study. I mean, there are people who have lost 30 kilograms, 40 kilograms. I mean, there are people who maybe were skinny and died because you cannot lose 30 kilograms if you are skinny, and so with these uh, huge attack, systemic attack on many organs, uh, th these guys die. So uh, I, I've seen very severe COVID with horrible physical consequences in professional athletes, which, you, which didn't have uh, one kilogram of fat, uh, and, and less severe COVID in patients. So it's, it's really a mess. When we studied the uh, mood disorders, we found that uh, um, I mean, MDD, we found that uh, this, this enhanced activation of the, immune of the innate immunity seems to be independent of uh, BMI, but surely correlated. Uh, but but it, it was not so clear, uh, let's say, um, a direction of effects. Uh, we, we know that uh, macrophages, I mean, monocytes activate toward the M1 uh, status in the uh, in the in the yellow fat, and this is uh, still under under investigation. It's anyway a very important, I think, uh, section uh, topic for further research. So thanks for the question. We we like, I mean, me and Lydia would have liked to to go through, so, you know, to have it more interactive. But we are here stuck. So please ask. Come here. Uh, come, you come here. We have here jump. Don't we would like to, to walk leg. around we the stage, but we were told to stick here <laughs> because of the camera. So <laughs> you know, I, was, uh, I actually wanted to make one comment to what you were saying right now uh, and also to your systemic uh, inflammation index, because what is very relevant in that index is that it's not just looking at immune cells, but also platelets. platelets yeah. Could it be that it's actually the platelets that are so predictive? Because the other immune indexes were, weren't so predictive weren't they? Yeah, I think the platelets play a major role. Uh, there has been a paper published in my, in my hospital, not by me, showing that there is an alternative mechanism of activation of platelets by COVID. This 
hell of a virus with its uh, spike protein can interact with a specific receptor expressed in platelets and, which is not the ACE2, and uh, make them degranulate and, and, and push them into an activating state which then recruits neutrophils. So there is a combined effect of platelet activation, endothelium suffering, which led to major thrombosis and death. And this is probably persisting. This is what we are studying now. Also, there is a huge literature uh, showing that patients with mood disorder for uncertain reasons have activated platelets and, and what do SSRIs do on platelets? And, uh, and that's sure, and that's <laughs> all, it's all, I think that this kind of positive feedbacks mm -hmm. are quite uh, frequent in, uh, in mm -hmm. the pathophysiology mm -hmm. of uh, disorders. And I think that depression is a, an illness of the whole body mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is a good example of it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, and there is indeed so much we don't know, and it's really difficult to study, <laughs> because indeed when we want to single out the immune system, by definition you're also looking at other kinds of systems and their circular effects. Um, I wanted to maybe uh, show a little bit yes, the, uh, the post-COVID uh, platform, wait, if, if perfect, it's okay. Perfect. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is uh, outside of my talk, but I think it's, it's really important, and in particular for people here uh, in France, uh, is it okay, Marion, if I'm presenting it? Yes, <laughs> okay. So Professor uh, Marion Le Boyer has uh, achieved the incredible. She has uh, found money to launch this post-COVID online platform. It's not online yet, but it will be in a few weeks' time. It's an international collaboration between uh, clinicians and researchers from uh, France, uh, Belgium, and Italy at this point. It will be launched first in France, in French and English, and then later translated for the other countries. And the aim is to create an easy to use platform for patients, for anyone in the general public who has had COVID and is worried about some kind of mental health symptoms that they're experiencing, but doesn't know where to start or where to seek help could also be used by, by relatives, by family, or by general practitioners. And it wants to provide good scientific information about the link of COVID-19 and mental health symptoms. Why? Because our uh, worry and our experience is that for many people, it is absolutely not clear that there is a link, an association between COVID infection and mental health problems. We see so many patients developing moderate to severe clinical, se clinical severity depressions after COVID, and they're not making the link themselves because no one, not even their GP, has bothered or thought to explain to them that actually it's very likely <laughs> that this depression is caused from the COVID. And then there's also other patients who are having s uh, some kind of long COVID syndrome symptoms like fatigue and insomnia, and they're not even considering that actually they might also be depressed at the same time. Or they're worried to go to their healthcare provider and say, well, I'm also really v very down and sad because then maybe the GP will tell them, oh, it's all in your head, you know, it's, it's probably just me, it's in your head and not to be taken seriously. So there are many reasons why people with this condition, post-COVID depression, post-COVID anxiety, are not finding help or seeking help. And we hope that this platform will be an entry point for them where they can find good information, but also screen themselves for their symptoms and get um, good uh, links to resources both online resources on the platform itself, but also professional support resources. So I'll give you a little demo of uh, what is on the platform. So uh, it's called the post-COVID platform here, but I think we said to change it to my post-COVID brain health, <laughs> which was the title that the patient's organization liked best. So uh, I'll just show you a little bit. So there is uh, information on long COVID, and then people can go through several kinds of symptoms and find some information there. And then there's also um, some uh, testimonies from other kinds of patients, so people can see and read and see maybe if they uh, feel the same way. Then they can take uh, a little survey, just three minutes, which will allow them to 
screen their own symptoms. Uh, first, they will type in uh, some keywords or some phrases, and that will be um, uh, looked at by AI to see which kind of words come up. They want some rating of their mood, of their sleep. And then, yes, they end up with this report on the most um, important topics, stress, welfare, sleep. And then from there, they can go on to um, a more in-depth screening with actual clinical rating scales that we are using uh, for um, looking at the severity of depression, of PTSD, of anxiety, of insomnia. So for instance, depression we're rating with the HATS, which is uh, a rating scale used in routine clinical practice, which has been clinically validated. And so based on the results of those questionnaires, we can actually um, with the cutoff, determine if this is clinical severity or not and give people personalized advice whether they should seek professional help for that problem um, or if they can just manage this themselves with some online tools or, um, or resources. So we think this is really important and, and I hope uh, it will be helpful to patients, it will be helpful to clinicians and we're uh, yeah, very excited to see this go live in a few weeks. So congratulations again, uh, Marion, for making this happen. Très bien, c'est 18 heures, donc on va, on va arrêter la session. Et encore, euh, bah, vous remercier pour votre euh, écoute, votre attention, puis remercier à nouveau les, les deux orateurs euh, brillants qui sont des euh, chercheurs, euh, probablement les meilleurs, the best in the world on COVID and other subjects. So we really thank you for your speakings. And it was a great honor to, um, to listen to your presentation. Thank you very much.